Oh, but what does he mean by saying he's got any imagination? <laughs> well, that's absurd to say that of himself. <laughs> oh, I tell you, what a misconception. Good Lord, somebody planted it in his mind. <laughs> I mean, it's all about, all about imagination. <laughs>
I mean, my mother knew that I could, I had some talent because she could see I couldn't do anything else. And she had bought me this paint pound number set thinking, this will keep him busy. This will keep him busy for a, you know, a while. I finished the painting in one afternoon. But I, I'd run out of some blue. There were two blues in the set and I ran out of, I ran out of the sky blue that was like six, 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 six for the blue, for the sky, you know, all these little patches. And, and there was only like, the seventh blue left, you know, and it was, it was lots of. So I thought, well, what do I do? Yes, I used the seventh blue for, for, for the little bit that I'd run out, for a little patch of sky. And it looked very odd, this one kind of sort of Prussian blue, you know, sky and the rest were ultramarine. And I thought, well, I'll just mix them like this and join them up, you know, sort of blending them in. And that was it, I was hooked, I was hooked. I thought, look at this, it's magic. You can blend in paint. I thought it's fantastic. You know, oh, this is great. I'm like, <laughs> and I loved it. I, I, and I, still, I went to the garage to look for house paint. You know, immediately I needed paint. And then I had, of course, all the, the other colors left over from the paint by number set and I painted my budgie. And that's where it started and it kind of just never stopped. 1964. And you did something, which I, I don't know if I should mention, uh, you used to do painting my numbers. When, when we were uh, children, it used to be children used to get in these sets that now are completely frowned on. Uh, you know, now, now they really, nobody has sells them because people think they've stifled children's imagination and what have you. Um, but, but I can remember him getting these as a Christmas present and really loving it and, you know, spending ages getting them just right. This is Simon's mother. His mum would come and stay with us. We lived in half a house. It was in Neil Agard's um, old house. And here's Simon in that same visit. Um, Simon and his mum in the park. And there you see Simon painting with a little stove. Um, he's, he's working there and pouring, the pouring in, in caustic into little tins. He was already starting to do caustic paintings he made with wax and pigment. I'm taking the paint from the palette onto the canvas the paint dries within seconds, so one can't think too much. The process of painting becomes very immediate and very quick. Things happen very quickly. As soon as the wax is dried on the surface, you can apply another layer. Well, I was in an old boys' school, you know, and there wasn't art, you know. It was a very sort of academic and rugby school, so. But my mother had heard that two of the kind of grade 12s, or matrix as we called them then, were going to the girls' school to do art. And so she kind of got wind of this and thought, well, if they can go, then my son can go. And she approached the headmaster and organised this, so off I had to go to the girls' school, which was quite daunting, you know, coming from an all, all boys' school. Simon asked me to pose for him. We were first year at Michaelis Art School. We were in the same class and there he did these sketches of me directly onto the etching plate. And this bird here, you see the wing is made of wire. This is a bit like a portrait of me at the time because I had made a sculpture in first year, bird girl, and the wings had, were made of wire. So there you see Walter Battis looking at it. This is at UCT Michaelis Art School that we went to. And here are some of our contemporaries. I took this picture um, the, day, the day that we were going to walk inside these large puppets that um, Adrian Kohler had made, who've now got the handspring puppet company, Basil Jones and Adrian. And there's Nina Rom. A lot of these people we still know. Here's a picture of Marlene Dumas. Uh, she was a contemporary of ours as well. 
a year older than us. On this side is Francis Burton. We met Simon at, at Michaelis. We were all students. We were, uh, we were two years ahead of him. So he came in um, and we sort of became aware of him simply because of the amazing abilities he already had as a student. Um, lecturers tried to mold him in, in, in their own particular way, but he kept on in his own style and his own Simon. He used to come in, so we shared the studio and we didn't really speak much. He'd sort of come in almost in a stormy mood and um, sort of get to work. No one quite knew who or how he was. He was highly revered. Um, I remember Kevin Atkinson, who was one of the uh, lecturers at Michaelis at the time, who encouraged a lot of abstraction, he said, Simon Stone is a barometer for creativity. And I thought, oh, that is so profound. The work of his that I'm the most familiar with is a painting of a, of a stove um, in a kitchen. And it hangs in a kitchen. And if you look at it very carefully, you'll find that it, it doesn't line up. The legs, the space, the geometry of it doesn't line up. Simon plays this very subtle game with one of the most banal objects. And you don't really notice it un unless you really give it a, the kind of slow, long look that I think one often does with a stove when there's like, you know, a chicken in the oven or, or whatever the case may be. And I think that is something that, that's, that I think he's really strong with, is, is not always creating gallery art, but creating art that works in private spaces with the kind of contemplation over, over months and years that that allows. Um, and it's a, it's a serious reward for a painting to tell you something sort of three years after you first saw it and having seen it many times in between. My first exhibition was with Ronnie Fabian in Cape Town. Uh, I just finished my studies at Michaelis and, and I had a show with him, which turned out to be okay. It, was a, uh, it wasn't a huge success, but I'd sold a few paintings. And th that was way back, I don't know when, 19, 1978. Simon wanted to be an artist and he proposed to me, he said, Giovanna, will you, do you want to marry me? Over the phone he proposed to me, he was in Cape Town and I was in Johannesburg and, but the only thing is, I will never get a job. I want to be an artist. I want to paint. And having gone to art school with Simon and having met him there and seen all the how excellent his work was I said of course I, I don't mind it you know if you don't get a job <laughs> you must paint because that's what you do best so we said goodbye to our parents and we went to live in Italy I was 24 we got married and I was 24 Simon was 26 I didn't do that much painting you know a few small things I uh... What I did a lot of was study a bit of Renaissance art. I could um, go to the galleries, museums, and just have a look around, and have a look around in the streets, looked at the art architecture, and that's mostly what I did. Right. There's a whole book I just do on old masters. Wow. You know, it's my copy book. It's, 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 it's not very full and it takes very long. So I just... I, 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 I learned through this, you know, I, I learned that through this. So I just do like there's Donatello, there's Goya, there's Pupiccio, there's Constable, there's Piero della Francesca. So I just make people look <laughs> awesome. There's Raphael, there's Google, there's Brian Jellico, there's my favourite Turner. It started raining. We'd lived there nine months. We'd been to Florence, Rome and settled in Milan. We were sort of running out of money, we couldn't get work, it was a difficult time, 1979 in Italy was not a good time to be 
young people were struggling to find work, they were struggling to find accommodation. And it was just very difficult, so we came back to South Africa. That's when we went to Johannesburg, because we had no money, and when you have no money, that's where you go. You go to Johannesburg, because it's easy, you can make some money there. And, uh, and that's where I started my career, sort of in earnest. I'd, I'd seen his, his mosaics, definitely, okay, and they were all around, but in terms of just identifying him with this new generation of kind of bolshy, sometimes brash, brilliant, um, sometimes bratish generation of, generations of artists, he was part of that. My first show in Johannesburg was at the Market Gallery, which was a kind of rite of passage. If you wanted to have a career in art, you had to show at the market gallery. Somehow that was the thing to do. And I, I had a reasonably unsuccessful show at the market gallery. I struggled to find a gallerist or somebody to represent me in Johannesburg. Eventually a woman called Corin McCarran gave me a show. And I had a few shows with her. And then I had my first show with Trent Reed. And I had many shows after that with, with Trent. The first exhibition that Karen McKeeran had given him, um, it happened to be that the artist Bill Ainsley went to that exhibition himself, approached Simon and said, this is amazing work. Why don't you come and teach at the Johannesburg Art Foundation? Simon was a person who is very, very quiet, and wanting straight. He actually taught, but he was not a, he's not a speaker. He was not a speaker, but on the way he would say, come, 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 come. He would, you know, you'll find his insight meaningful on the work that you're doing. It was an extended community of people. And yet, ironically, it was also at the height of the apartheid system during that very same period. And uh, the Art Foundation was like uh, one of the places where people from all race groups could come together. I suppose then we all filtered in there, um, our energies were focused there and then went back to our studios and painted. It was an extraordinary environment where there was a pulse, there was a rhythm. We all were downtown Joburg people and we all felt very, very proud of being within this community. I mean, it is so different to when in the 90s we came to Cape Town, uh, Simon to Neisner. It's like a radically different world. It's, it's two different planets. Uh, there was quite a nice family of, of artists at that point who were doing stuff in a way out of necessity and not to be a famous artist or just doing, doing things to somehow not be caught in some other reality. There were sort of this whole hub and uh, Robert Weinek and you know it was a whole group of like sort of Art activists. Restaurant. Ron Kruger was the. He had a restaurant in the pet shop in Troibel, and then um, Robert Weinick had a bar. Yeah, so that's like Bob's bar. And Wayne, Wayne Barker was there on the scene. Mm -hmm. Wayne was a sort of a bit of a protege of Simon, or they got on very well. They liked each other's art, they used to swap art. He was living in Johannesburg in an area which was at that time on the edge of town, the edge of the city in a beautiful house. Um, All the rooms are studios. They are lounge in the corridor. Yes, passage. the lounge was in the, the corridor. The lounge the was in the passage. <laughs> so you used to sit in this narrow passage and, uh, and then Giovanna would produce the most amazing food. We used to have these fantastic lunches um, where all these interesting people used to come, like Rashada Krauss and her, and her children. 
Linda Moross and Roger Ballin. Um, Wayne Barker would come and play chess, a game of chess with Simon. It used to be like a home at, at Simon's house. I used to go there any time I want to go to visit Simon, then I go. And any time they want to visit me, they just come. It's just a home. This whole generation of artists who were breaking out of this kind of what we call a cultural cringe, okay, that art takes place in, a, in, an, in another sphere that is better than us. And that was all courtesy of apartheid. It was um, the isolation that we'd been experiencing for decades. And we were now breaking out. It was just before the first democratic elections. And you had this absolute wellspring of talent, of global talent, that was emerging. So it was an incredibly exciting time. It's like he can move between styles like so freely. It's like not trying to follow like trends or anything. These are all moments in time. And I mean by putting them all together it's like each each painting is like a survey of a moment in time. This painting by Simon Stone was painted in 1977 and I have a particularly strong memory of seeing it uh, when it was presented at a studio crit at the Michaela School of Fine Art. Everybody was riveted by the shocking events surrounding the murder of Steve Biko at the time. And Simon produced this painting it kind of attempts to reproduce, in every sense, the kind of crudity of a kind of quickly taken documentary photograph um, that was put through the Ben Day dot process. So there's a sense of very, very strong immediacy, a very immediate kind of reaction to historical events as they were unfolding at the time. This Simon did when he was in the army in 1984. Remember in the old days we had conscription, so you, you know, you, when you were 18, when you were out of school, you had to go to the army. I mean, then now you have to ask yourself, how can he be doing, how, can, how, how does he have time? And everybody's busy running around, leopard crawling. He's got time to do these fine, exquisite um, watercolors, uh, water gua and gouache. He didn't have active duty during the day. Um, how he got that was... He, he, had, he suffered from night, from night blindness, which I've never heard of, to be honest. But um, uh, he, he couldn't see at night. He was blind, so he, he had a medical reason he couldn't really go into combat. And stuff. But the night blindness obviously <laughs> went away during the day. So he had all these hours that he could spend, and he thought, a fine time to spend painting. And so he painted the camps. And I think these are such amazing records of a specific time. Simon always had his sketchbook with him and he painting all the time. He paint, Simon paints all the time. And um, he's, he gives, he's given me wonderful um, glimpse into the life of somebody who just paints all the time, unlike other people. Um, other artists, I mean, they could paint all the time, but I I've lived with Simon and we know. Some hills in the distance, mountains, road. That's what I'm painting, that little copy in the distance there. Coming round. I've moved the painting into the sun, and you can just kind of see. When I started kind of dropping in landscapes into, into the work, this landscape is a scene somewhere just over the Orange River, sort of the southern part of the Free State, very beautiful. Mountains are just absolutely gorgeous and there's that, you know, we talk about that kind of the South Africa I love and I often wondered what, what that South Africa is. It's like the view out of the window when you're traveling from Johannesburg to Cape Town, you know, and you one doesn't really stop the car, you just look out the window and you and you you see your own country kind of just passing you and you and this was a bit like that it's it's either, you can't really see it here, but there's a slight blur 
on, on the little bosses in the front, you know, while the, 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 the foreground is quite still and, the, and, the, and the, the foreground is kind of going past in a blur. So there's a, there's a bit of movement there and there's a little nude standing here and then there's a, a contact sheet from a, from a Yushika camera and it's, it's scenes of Johannesburg and the Jeppistown Fire Office and uh, there's a little picture of the moon and there's my wife, very small. And there's some buildings there and some more buildings there and then there's a, there's a vague sort of landscape as a background and then there's there's the world far away like America there's the 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 the, the Empire State Building sort of quite vague and that's how I kind of see the the world out there it's like quite vague and, and sort of far away and there are about connections between ideas and sensations and experiences of distance um, Walter Benjamin talks about painting as a kind of a vertical slice through the world and that's concerned with visual appearances and the world of surfaces and drawing as being a horizontal section through the world like a map or a diagram so that drawing is about conceptual relationships rather than visual appearances um, and it feels like uh, in um, in some of Simon's work, the, the, those two categories kind of come together. For one thing, there's a drawing -y kind of quality to to some of what he does, so kind of outlines of a female nude combined with, you know, not photorealistic, but relatively realistic, um, maybe postcard of New York or something right next to it. Um, there's a way that I think that might be thinking about the experience of uh, kind of what it is to be conscious in a way. That it, so there's there's uh, there's kind of personal intimate contact with another human being, um, uh, and there's there's the kind of experience of the world as mediated by images. Realistic images are evoking that sense of a world that's coming to you from a distance. And the drawn images, which frequently are uh, female bodies or sometimes uh, male figures as well, evoke that, that feeling of a, of a lived world, of a kind of uh, a, uh, the world from the inside. You know, drawing, you know, essentially sketchbooks are about drawing, you know. And I'm not sure, of, you know, the distinction between drawing and painting has become closer and closer to me over the years. I mean, right from the start, way back in sort of 1982, when I started these sketchbooks, I was drawing with a brush rather than, say, a Conte or a piece of charcoal. Although that's how they started. They started with Conte and charcoal, but very soon I moved to a brush. It was more fluid, uh, it was more direct, and, 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 and somehow it just worked better. The early drawings were, were basically all out of my mind. I, I very seldom had a reference. It's like a contradiction that if you've got an empty mind, but you're concentrating at the same time. You know, it's a bit of a contradiction, but that's how the drawings start. It's like the software is empty. And the hardware is all geared up. I know something has to come down here. You know, I mean, I can't just leave it, but I'm not sure what. Maybe like some sort of platform. His work flows out of him, and I don't think he even knows what it is or what he's painting some of the time. You know, you know, the very early drawings are all, they're just a bunch of lines, really. I, there's, they're, they're, I seldom seem to find a direction back then. And at some stage, I must have started looking for a reference, you know, either going out there, you know, into the street and taking a little sketchbook and drawing a building or taking a photograph 
But somewhere along the line, I started collecting these, um, I call them sort of references, photographs. Some of mine, most of them were taken from uh, magazines. Uh, 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 to keep them in order, I have these uh, groupings or categories like buildings, men, women, science, politics. Another, another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put these. These are these are buildings. And this is the worm building. And it's an oil rig, and there's a residential house, and there's some skyscrapers from New York, a church. Tunnel. I don't know what that one is. I don't know what it is. You just stick it at the bottom of the box. So this is sort of like men and a men a men box. There they are, one after the other. And I never know when I'm going to use them. They're just sort of there. Some go back. Some go back to time of the Second World War. Military. There's one. War. Because if you look at Simon's work, you see a lot of landscapes. So you have a lot of the Kuru, and that seems to be the place where he goes, his respite, he goes to relax and gather himself again. So a lot of his work, you see there's a calmness in his work when he does um, scenes of, of, of the crew and yet there's an intensity as well in the ins inserts. So me, I see two sides to Simon, like a duck on the water, it's very smooth. Under the water there's, we're going like this. I was just working on sheets of paper and I suddenly realized that they were piling up and I, you know, I, I, after a few months I had all these piles of paper and I had to find another way to get ideas out but not have all these piles of paper around. So I started working, I made my first sketchbook, I got newsprint, I squashed them together, all the newsprint, a whole ream, 500 pages, and I glued the edge and I made a book. Uh, and then they stopped selling reams of newsprint and I moved to a type of cartridge and now I just use fax paper or what they call copy paper and I still buy, buy the books myself and I have a very simple method that works and they don't seem to fall to pieces. When Simon was living in Johannesburg I knew him fairly well and um, he knew that I, my main collection, my main interest was collecting artist books. I think he came here and he saw, I think for the first time, what artist books were all about. And I told him I was particularly interested in artist books rather than paintings or drawings or whatever. So he got them out and I kind of coerced him, I think. I said, really, I want to buy the picture, but I really want to buy the, the sketchbook. Sketchbooks are a sort of sub-genre of... Um, artist books as a whole and so I was lucky enough to buy two uh, sketchbooks from him at the time which are in the artist book collection rather than the art collection. There was an expectation that students gave their intentions when they wanted to do a work and I never understood this I couldn't understand I never had an intention I thought you just do things and uh, it was a sort of intellectual thing and I I always somehow worked around that without ever having any intention. And to this day, I still don't have an intention. So it was always a search for something to paint. That was the reason I started them. All right, so I was born in Lady Grey, and we lived there for five years. I think my father thought the school at Lady Grey wasn't really good enough, so we moved to Queenstown. I started going to Queen's College. I mean, I just looked out the window and dreamt at school. I never did my homework. I failed on a regular basis. But somehow the art thing persisted. It just kind of kept at me and I, 
I remember starting these little, funny little watercolour things where I, I, I flicked watercolour, some kind of paint, I don't know what it was, it must have been watercolour, onto bits of paper and I just made hundreds of them. And um, I think they just got thrown away. So, I mean, there was something there. That was like the beginning of the sketchbooks in a way, this like one thing after the other, you know, just do it. And many, many faces where that one now is and then Sometimes out of frustration, you just go boom, 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 and there's the face, and it kind of works. But, but everything else is not simple. The perspective and the, the, the way you've painted it and your choice of colours and your, the movement and everything else that's gone into it. So I don't see it as a simple painting, is what I'm trying to say. All right, I struggled a little bit, but I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as one does with just about all, I mean, you have to, I mean, you know, it doesn't just happen, you know, you have to do a bit of work, you've got to do the footwork, or the brushwork, or whatever work. The best way to understand Simon is to see these books. Um, when you page through them, um, you start understanding his language, you start understanding his process. Um, many artists, uh, you know, have come to the show um, and have spent hours here because this kind of solidifies and proves that Simon is really an artist's artist. When you see it all together, it kind of puts everything into perspective. You realize that this is a very dedicated painter who has spent his entire life pursuing a very specific form of research, communicating and speaking in his own language, which I think we have been slow to understand, the audience in South Africa has been slow to understand, and I really hope that there's still an opportunity for a wider audience to start um, discovering Simon Stone. This book, book 95, I make a little cover, but sort of... I date the first drawing of each day, and then I do some drawings, some sketches, there's a little scene of a off ramp into Johannesburg. And then th that was the drawings for one day. Then the next day starts again and I date the first day. And I do a little sketch. And I continue. Sometimes it's one drawing a day, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's six. Sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's eight, and sometimes it's nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty drawings that day, which is very rare. The average is about six a day. And, and then I put the page number down and I put like a little title to the, to the drawing. The titles he gives his work, I think, are amusing and complicated and profound sometimes. Sometimes they just matter of fact, but they're always chosen with great care. And they, they add a dimension to the paintings, which is very enriching, I think. I mean, I think they're delightful. For instance, Joburg split with Fra Angelico. And then now and then it's like figure in landscape. It's also somehow a statement of sorts. Self-portrait with Three Mile Island where you can't see his face. <laughs> and the, the stove is the stove. <laughs> you know, they, they're sort of a bit meaningless to me, but at least if they sound interesting, I can go and look them up and then find that drawing and turn it into a painting. I think he's one of those, like, you know, Villard and one of those intimate artists where um, you're not political, you're not, you know, an artist that represents a community, you, you represent an inner world of a painter and the inner machinations of somebody's mind and the way that it works. I think at times in most cases when one draws, the, the whole idea is in the head, but whichever tool you use, 
It's like you are transmitting the thought into the tool and all that. But uh, the, the other thing is that it doesn't necessarily come out exactly the way as you, you have it in the mind. So there's that space in your head that you kind of tap into and bring these images that might be a representation of what is happening in the physical world but they come from somewhere else. Now just try and focus on the end of the brush. That's about the only concentration I've really got. If, if, if one's mind is there at the kind of contact point between brush and paper, because that's the point of transference. The feelings and emotions and ideas running around in one's mind, just to get them out, let them just flow through the brush. It's a bit of a gamble. I also don't have imagination myself. Simon says that is very truth. Because with imagination, you do what you're thinking, what you think you should do. Simon pick up anything, even this phone can be on, her, on his work because it's in front of him. So I take a pen, I have an, any charcoal or pen, a pencil, I just draw without imagination. It just comes out. So I think when you're an artist without imagination, that's where the creativity, creativity is. Why I chose one image to put with another image? There, there was never really a logic to it. I, I, I'll just work on a kind of gut feeling, a sort of instinctive quality that I needed. At times you don't know whether it's a conscious or a subconscious, but it's this magical space that at times is very hard to describe. I think he enjoys taking the subject, uh, the, the, the object, and actually putting it into the picture as if it's, it's always been there, you know. Um, the Tupperware, Tupperware. Plastic bottles, mirror. You now just drop the mirror in. It's like maybe it doesn't have to be there, but there it is. What can you do? One of the things I kind of looked for were was a sort of sense of inevitability. It had to look right. It had to look that it wouldn't be any other way. The photograph would become like a still life. I could observe the photograph and transfer it into a drawing. You know, why, why, why choose an image that's already existing? You know, what would that mean? Why, why take it, sort of reduce it in a way to, to a kind of essential quality? You ask him about his work and you kind of, sometimes it's a bit like drawing blood from, <laughs> from the stone. <laughs> he, he will give you all the references and the art historical um, intertextualization. I mean, but those works communicate on a different level altogether. I mean, my interest in the history of art, you know, it, it starts at the, at the beginning, really. It, it, when I mean the beginning, I mean things like the caves of La Salle in France, those, those images of bulls in the cave, those huge images that are so perfectly drawn, you know, 25,000 years old. People are, are kind of making these images. They don't, even, they don't even have the wheel or a table or a chair, or, you know, but, they, but yet they're making these images, perfect images of five foot big bulls. You know, what is that? What does it mean? You know, why is that so strong and so perfectly developed? Uh, that's been a big interest of mine. 
got to do with this archaeological sort of um, um, tendency, this need to gather up the, the different pieces in the world, his own fragments, and, and, um, and through the fragments reflect his own life. Um, so in other words, one knows oneself through the details one accrues, and, uh, and one learns how to move from point to point, um, not because of some sort of fabulous sort of, um, sort of prophetic or dream space, um, but because of this prosaic grasp of the everyday and the detail. And that is the point. When he says he has no imagination, it's, it, it's, it's not being disingenuous. Um, or even dramatic or even provocative. He's simply saying that he understands his place in the world and um, he understands the fragmented and partial nature of that place in the world and he moves in accordance with that partiality. A lot of motifs and a lot of symbols regularly repeat in Simon's work, even certain forms of mark making, um, you know, either there'd be little dots or little um, spots which make up a human being. These are, let's say, more curved kind of elements that make up a person. And, you know, it ties into the idea that, you know, a human being is made up of experiences, history, beliefs, and so many formative um, elements. You know, I think it's good to, for an artist to kind of know what's being done because otherwise you just do the same old thing, you know, and to, to, to maybe, you know, because I think artists are, are well, certainly I, I was or I am very easily influenced. I mean, I can see something and immediately my mind says, well, I want to do that as well, you know, and I have to kind of hold myself against that and say, well, be myself, you know. Just kind of follow your own thing. You can have a look at these things and it's good to know what people have done because you've got to have a tradition to work against. You know, otherwise you can go off and kind of often kind of do your own thing and go so far into your own thing that it, it, it bears very, you know, there's no reference to the modern world around you. And, uh, you know, I think that's quite important to, to, to have a context that you work in, and, and the context is the, is the world around me. I mean, I'm not too worried about what's happening elsewhere. This frames that are coming on top of each other, and the perspective is not the pictorial perspective, and it's not the, based on um, Western uh, perspective, that it's kind of like the illusionistic painting that you try to create exact of what is exist in in your surroundings so he's he creates this new world that is beyond the time and beyond the space which we still could could relate with because it has the elements of things that we recognize but we're not necessarily sure uh, what is the relation and we create those relation and the way that i read it it's different with the way that you read it because each picture has this, this sim symbols and um, the meanings that it carries by itself. The first of our Simon Stones, uh, my wife Anne gave me on the occasion of the birth of our daughter Alice, so we can date it exactly 1984. So it's one of his very early paintings and it was very similar to the work he was doing as a student and has continued in a way to do of these very simple still lives in which the picture is about the paint. And the beauty of the piece, and the piece that, the quality that makes one come back to the picture year after year and day after day for the last 30 years, has to do with fine tones, with finding an entire palette just in the range of greys and the shifts of shadow that exist with the purple in the shadow of the cup, the slight pink in the grey of that trivet, 
the marvelous way that piece of wood is painted. I mean, there's a whole painting in itself just in that, in that torch. And that sort of pleasure in still life and turning objects into paint, I would say, has been his life's project. And it's landed on many subjects, on the nude, on landscape, on details, but in a way the heart of it is shown for me most strongly in his still life paintings. He is the master of paint in the country, I think, in terms of his dedication to the craft of using either encaustic or oil paint, but finding a meaning of the world in that fine gradation of the material itself. Well, if you tell, you know, I've tried to explain to people the beauty of a series of paintings of sinkers, <laughs> and you, you can't, but every sinker has its own personality. Every, every one of his um, concrete objects is so filled with with emotion and and being and at the same time there's a contradiction a contrast I guess that often the human images are quite distant there's um, a coldness and an inaccessibility often about the human figures that is juxtaposed against this deep accessibility of the the concrete object I met Simon in Johannes Street in Troyville back yeah, in late 80 and Simon had just hadn't even started his mosaics then when no. I met Simon <laughs> In fact, it was during that train violence, you remember, because Troyville was near the railway line and then there was, it was between George Gough and Jeppe or something, that, that the, um, there would be these terrible attacks on the trains and they would throw people off the train and chop them off with, um, with uh, pangas. And then there's a men, what are men doing? They're not doing too much, they're usually just standing around and pointing at things. Or... They never seem to know what to do, these men. So I have this category of men. Who's this guy? This, this, this painting is kind of the history of bushfires, and there's greys and browns and, and, and a little bit of blue and more sort of yellowy colours, and this one's sort of purples and blues and bits of yellow. There's not much red in, 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 in a lot of these paintings. There's maybe a little armband there. So there's red in the browns, of course. Every now and again I have to work with red and then I thought well I can't make three marks with red just make the whole bloody painting red you know so that's what I do I, I get this urge just to use lots of red. My favorite Simon Stone painting of all time um, is a painting called The Homecoming. It's a painting that was done in 1988 in a very very important period historically um, and it's as if Simon kind of anticipated the homecoming of the exiles, the kind of return of people to you know, a new South Africa, but the painting is incredibly heavy, but it's also um, a symbol of home and how you, know, you can be far away and still you have just one kind of beacon that, 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 that brings you back. My favourite painting of my father's would be actually a very recent painting. It's a very large painting and it's been painted with only three colours. Uh, yellow ochre, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. The painting is called Stalin Collecting Dust um, and features a kind of uh, grey, uh, greyed out black and white portrait of Stalin on the left and he's composed that next to uh, a kind of strong-looking businessman but then he's also thrown in um, a photograph of Birmingham in the late 60s and then he's juxtaposed that with uh, a nude standing on a rock uh, near the beach um, and then right in the center of that is this kind of white plastic piece of garden furniture which is so random and, and just doesn't fit in at all but it 
works and um, it's almost quite, it's quite comical in a way. I never forget when I was younger and he pointed out these white plastic garden furniture chairs and he said, these chairs are so global and they're so universal that they exist in every country, in every person's garden in the world. You could go to some tiny town in the Philippines and you'll see them. You could go somewhere in Mexico and they're there. You could go to someone's porch in New York and they're there. And that's, again, it's just, you know, his observations of these random objects that exist in our world. And he frames them in a completely new way. You know, you have to rush now. I'm, I'm, I was a bit flat this morning and now I'm like completely flat. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, it is exhausting. Yeah, you know why? Yeah, and I painted. I didn't make him paint. I painted. Yeah, look at our, our, our lives. We look at our whole life and it's exhausting when we actually see all the photos and we go back into back into the, into our lives. Because that's what our art is. Our art represents pictures of our lives. When we walked into the retrospective, we, we shed a tear because there were a hundred paintings of Simons on show at the Standard Bank that they collected from people's homes. It was his first exhibition then back in Johannesburg for quite a period. Simon's work is significant because so much of it portrays scenes from uh, the city of Johannesburg. In ogni oggetto, in ogni particolare del quadro, c'è una storia. Soprattutto i primi due che mi hanno colpito sono stati il quadro con le scatole perché capisci che quelle scatole vuote in realtà rappresentano tanti pezzi di storia di Simon Stone e probabilmente l'altro, che è un quadro molto piccolo, è quello delle sigarette anche perché è un vizio che ho anch'io e mi rendo conto che questa catastarle così è come se lui mettesse lì tutte le sue preoccupazioni, tutta la sua ansia e lo riesce a esprimere però in realtà con una gentilezza e con una bellezza, una semplicità che è fantastica. I didn't really know very much about Simon or his work. I was quite daunted and overwhelmed because although I'd written books before, I'd written on subjects that had been fairly thoroughly researched. Whereas with Simon, it was almost like virgin territory. His pictures to me present a problem. So my first decision had to be whether all this was random and meaningless or whether there was a meaning behind it. And I wanted to believe it was a meaning behind it, otherwise it simply didn't make sense. Why paint if you have nothing to convey? And if ever I asked him a technical question, there would never be intellectual reasons there would always be purely compositional reasons whereby he justified his choices about the subject matter of his paintings. But I think there always is an underlying link and that really it springs from his subconscious. This painting is called Domestic Rain. It was painted in the early 80s. Um, and the thing about it is that it's, it really is a commentary on society. I mean, you have this very settled town buildings and you would think that's the the model of um, of a settled and productive society and then you, you you have this stark contrast of all this detritus that mankind produces so raining down and almost shattering this myth of, of, of great order and great settlement underpinned by our ancestors and so people who we think were not quite there in terms of development had stages to go um, and so I guess you could make two interpretations. One, you know, is the society a, a natural progression of that, or is in fact it is a complete distortion? And which one, in fact, reflects um, a, a better reality in terms of the order of man? The way he handles collage, I think that is really, really interesting. They're not all seamlessly merged together, and that's why I didn't like the sort of 
reference to surrealism because surrealism everything exists within the same landscape they're all in the same room at the same time whereas with Simon's work I felt that everything was existing it sounds weird but in different realities there was a sort of simultaneity of reality kind of this mix of things and I've, I've time has been a, a it is it's critical for me to kind of mix it up I remember a couple of years ago at Everard Reed where there were lots of little windows in a painting and one looked like Mira and the other one would look like Jackson Pollock and the other one would look like a Picasso and I said to him gosh Simon this this you you can paint in so many different styles and they're all in this one painting but you don't look at the painting and think gosh now he's gone and combined all these different styles he has a way of sort of making you think it's you know just Simon doing a painting and he laughed and he said, yes, sometimes when I look at it, it uh, uh, I think to myself, it looks like a group show, which is just such a funny, witty, clever comment to make anyway. Simon's paintings sometimes remind me of a cabinet of curiosities, the canvas being the vitrine and in it these carefully curated, found objects with great mystery and significance placed in some kind of dynamic constellation with each other. Simon, for me, is a, is a metaphysician of the object. And um, the way he connects objects and puts them on paper is very much defined by his intuition. There's another painting called The, the Reading of the Text. And uh, it's just a man sitting, reading some text. And these bubbles going down his back, I think, are, are sort of something happening in his spine. You know, like, uh, I don't know, like, like little thought bubbles going down. And uh, this white square superimposed on his body, almost, it's almost as, as if it's, he's reading the text and that's where it's going to be, it's going to be collected. You know, it comes in through his eye and goes into his brain and then it gets somehow stored in his body. Well, I'm sort of unaware of, of, of who I reference. Um, I mean, Giovanna's been like my muse, and she does come up regularly. You know, even, even she somehow seems to appear, even when I'm trying to make her not appear, she seems to just tumble into the picture. And, which is okay, you know, I don't mind that. It's a bit like Bonnard, who painted his wife his whole life, and the older she got, he just carried on painting her as if she was a young girl. You know, I think I, I often include my daughter and I sometimes see friends of mine kind of just appearing when I'm painting men. I think, well, this looks like so-and-so who I know or it looks like that person. And I just let that happen. I don't kind of question that too much. I mean, it's bound to, to happen because it's better to paint the things that you really know well rather than something that one doesn't understand. Things that flash past you, images, postcards, things you've seen once and then you see the ones in Simon's painting and it makes you remember. They're all um, triggers of memory and conversation and objects that you've seen. They're all self-portraits and they're very much Simon looking at himself. But the Simon that we all know, the, the crazy Simon, the vague Simon, the person who, who never knows what a painting is about, um, uh, the self-portraits are, are, are a way of getting to know him a little bit better. This is a family portrait. We are the stone family, but this is, this is actually a wooden family. <laughs> and uh, this represents Simon. That's our new little baby. This is my sexy leg, and that's me on that side there. Artists matter because of their singularity and they are not sort of representatives of any sort of governing ideal or idea that might shape or define a nation. 
I think even though there's a strong sense of place in, in, in Simon Stern's work, it is not a place that is um, overdetermined by the idea of nationhood. Even, I'd say, overdetermined by something rather dubious, the idea of the contemporary, um, which is a widget in terms of the term. What defines the contemporary? Time shifts perpetually. The now is never. The place in me, at any rate, that the work um, sort of gets is really um, an existential space, a quiet space, a psychological space, a deeply personal space. Because he's not a statement artist, he's not somebody who's tried to manifest some grand design or some sort of uber ideology um, or some massive protest system at all. Um, but he has, in many ways, tried to deal with a degree of psychological unsettlement in terms of white South African experience. Um, and he's done it in ways that are very, very understated and careful, without in any ways being acutely self-conscious. So in terms of my own experience with him, it's very much atmospheric, as it's been in, in my ether for decades. Although he was, he might not have been aware, but uh, he had a great influence on most of the people who were at the Art Foundation because of his uh, way of working in all these different uh, directions. It, they were all driven by the simplicity that he had with uh, technical, the technical, his technical ability. And I think up to now he's still a major influence to those who come across his work. It's unfortunate because somehow maybe he's misunderstood. That doesn't really surprise me because like looking at Simon Stone, his, his character is like that. He's not somebody who's just going to be like showy, ostentatious, you know, this is me, da 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 da. So I think he's cool like that. There's no doubt that he's one of the top South African artists. This painting, it's called The Coachman. I think it's a very confident statement by Simon about his whole career and his whole practice. This involvement of himself and his own mind, you know, the idea that a coachman takes you on a journey, um, sometimes over many years with different passengers. There's some kind of con continuous stream of consciousness that one sees playing through the work. Um, incidental things, like a living, moving camera, I suppose. The meaning of a work of art must be so, it, it, it's so multifaceted that it can survive those specific windows which any ideology would want to, you know, push onto it because I'm not really a theorist or an intellect, so I don't, I don't understand the, the kind of theory too much. I just think art should be democratic, you know? It's a freedom, there's a freedom in art, you know? And if you, if you, can, if you can do, take a camera and tie a piece of string onto it and switch the camera, the movie on, let's say a moving camera, and, and swirl it around your head and take, a film of the landscape while you're doing that. You know, you can do that. That's allowed. You know, it's like, I mean, I believe in the, the what's the word, proclamation, the proclamation of art. I proclaim this to be art, therefore it is art. Um, but then at the, in the same breath, then I must be free to like take some minerals, some organic minerals or some uh, uh, ground up, plant matter or ground up stones and then mix some oil with it and put it on a surface, which is essentially what painting is. 
mean, if you think of it that way, it's a bit crazy, you know, doing this thing. You know, making images, you know, pushing paint, this oily stuff around the surface. You know, I should be allowed to do that. I mean, I am allowed to do it. Nobody's kind of stopping me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking absolute rubbish now. No, no, it's brilliant. I can't find my Kamori, but... Um, Ah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>